Episode 251, The End of Anne's Tyranny This is Dean Soup. Michael introduced him to Bessie. Bessie greeted Dean Soup politely. Dean Soup, hello. Dean Soup sat back down and smiled at her. In front of the Science and Technology Department's new treasure, he wasn't stingy with his smiles. By the way, he said, This is the head professor of your computer science major, Dr. Carlos Weatherby. After exchanging a few words, Bessie explained her reason for coming. Wait. Dr. Weatherby was silent for a while. Then he turned to Bessie and asked, What do you want to minor in now? Nuclear engineering. Bessie repeated. Dr. Weatherby fell silent and subconsciously frowned. Dean Soup was also taken aback, and it took him a long time to speak. We'll only open up the second majors next year, or the year after. Furthermore, Bessie, I advise you to concentrate on only one major. After all, she shouldn't bite off more than she could chew. If she was distracted from the beginning, she could be too overwhelmed to complete the program. Bessie was the focal point of the school because of her exam results. Her sudden decision made Dean Soup feel put on the spot. He knew that most geniuses were arrogant. Perhaps she had become overconfident due to her smooth sailing so far. Dean Soup glanced at Michael after speaking. Michael was sitting casually on the stool, drinking tea slowly. When Dean Soup looked over, he just raised an eyebrow. He didn't say anything. Dr. Weatherby's eyebrows were still knitted tightly. Dean Soup sat up straight and asked seriously, If you study two majors in your first year of the program, how are you going to allocate your preparation time? President Flores had finally snatched Bessie from the University of Chicago. She was a talent meant to be cultivated by the science and technology department in the future, so Dean Soup didn't really want her to go astray. Still as self-righteous as before, Bessie said, I'll concentrate on studying nuclear engineering. Dean Soup was at a loss for words. He thought, then why did you choose automation as your major? At this time, Marvin came in with James and Tucker. Dean Soup didn't know James, but he knew Marvin. So when he saw Marvin standing behind Michael, he didn't ask further and focused on Bessie for now. Bessie thought for a while and said, Dean Soup. I'll take the midterm and final exams of computer science every year. If I don't place first at any time, I'll drop the computer science major and concentrate on nuclear engineering. Dr. Weatherby was just as speechless as Dean Soup. He thought, then why did you choose computer science if you only want to quit? This plan of hers was pretty arrogant. Dr. Weatherby laughed angrily after hearing it and simply wanted to knock her awake with a ruler. Bessie, do you think computer science is so easy to learn? You think you can get a perfect score without attending lessons? Bessie rubbed her nose and thought, Yes, I can. But she didn't say anything. If she had come alone today, Dean Soup would have closed the door directly and ignored her nonsense. But unfortunately, Michael was sitting there drinking tea. Michael's reputation was too prestigious in Evanston. However, Dean Soup also had a countermeasure. He pondered for a while and turned to Dr. Weatherby. Dr. Weatherby, do you still have the professional examination papers for the finals? Northwestern University's midterm and final papers were very difficult. After all, it was one of the top universities in the country. In recent years, it had even been ranked in the top 50 internationally, so nobody dared apply without meeting the high standards. Hearing this, Dr. Weatherby immediately understood the dean's intentions. He took out his phone and asked one of his students to send him last year's final examination paper. It was printed directly in Dean Soup's office. Dean Soup glanced at Bessie and said, this is the computer science department's finals test paper from last year. If you can pass it, I'll approve your second major. Bessie thought about it. Are you sure? She asked. Dean Soup breathed a sigh of relief. Of course. While waiting, James was cautious at first, but after noticing Dr. Weatherby was a little angry, 
he couldn't help but whisper anxiously to Marvin. Marvin knew why Bessie was here, but he also knew that she was an insider of the World Poker Tour's Artificial Intelligence Department. He explained to James in a low voice. When James heard this, he wasn't as sure as Marvin and anxiously asked, So what now? Will Bessie leave a bad impression on her teacher? Marvin shook his head and whispered, Don't worry. Before long, Dr. Weatherby had printed four papers. They were all freshman final papers. Dr. Weatherby knew that Bessie had scored 150 on her mathematics paper and didn't dare to take out the finals paper for advanced mathematics. He feared that the dean of the mathematics department wouldn't give up if he knew she had taken it. Excluding the other miscellaneous basic courses, he printed out four core courses in the end. They were University Computer Science, Power System Engineering, Intelligence Control, and Computer Programming. He handed Bessie the four printed test papers. Bessie reached out for them. Dean Soup had already stepped aside and offered his desk for her to write the papers. Dr. Weatherby stared at Bessie. He knew that her theory was very good. So, she should perform well on the computer science paper. But the contents of the other three papers, especially the computer programming paper, would only be learned in the next semester. It wasn't taught in high school. Most students new to computer science would stress him out with how their program codes were. Most importantly, how difficult were the final exam questions of Northwestern University? They were all test questions for professors in that major. He had specifically found the four exam papers with the most subjects. Dr. Weatherby held a cup of tea and hummed softly. This little kid. I'll give you a pen. Dean Soup passed his pen to her. She took the pen and then sat down on a chair. Instead of writing straight away, she just looked through the four papers. They were all from freshman courses. Flipping through the papers, she paused at the last test paper. Of course, this last test paper is confusing to those who have yet to study it. Dr. Weatherby noticed her hesitation. He had asked the assistant to find the paper with the highest percentage of failure. That's why I said that the freshman sources aren't for you. No, Bessie raised her hand and tapped the pen with her fingertips. This last test paper has to be operated on a computer. There's a program in it, she said earnestly. Picking up his teacup and standing aside, Dean Soup smiled and said patiently, You can use my computer. Bessie nodded and thanked him. Okay. Normally, every year at Northwestern University, a computer room would be specially opened up for the test papers that required computer operations. Most of the questions were half-completed procedures that the student would then have to complete. How was she going to complete half of the program on a random computer? Dr. Weatherby had originally wanted to tell her to operate it in the computer room, but when Bessie replied, okay, so decisively, he suddenly stopped. Instead of reminding her, he held onto his teacup calmly. That would teach her to underestimate computer science. To the side, James looked on in a bundle of nerves. He repeatedly asked Marvin if something was wrong. Tucker, on the other hand, sat beside Michael calmly, playing games on his phone. Marvin comforted James and looked down at the game on Tucker's phone. It was a jumping grid game. The square design looked rather interesting. Marvin thought it looked fun and whispered to Tucker, What game is this? Where can I download it? Glancing at him expressionlessly, Tucker paused and then fixed his eyes on the lace umbrella in Marvin's hand. He replied indifferently, You can't download it. My sister programmed it. Marvin paused, then said, Oh. He wiped his face and turned back. They spoke in low voices and James didn't hear them. He just looked down at Tucker, wondering why he wasn't worried about his sister. Tucker seemed happy just to be able to come to Evanston. While Bessie was writing, Dean Soup and Dr. Weatherby chatted with Michael. Bessie wrote according to the order of the papers. She started with the computer science paper. The content of the freshman year wasn't very profound, but the question setter had included tricky questions. 
It was easy for any student who didn't listen properly in lectures and study the subjects seriously to fall into the trap. But Bessie had read Mr. Cheatham's books and answered the questions smoothly. Compared to the high school papers, the college papers didn't have as many questions, but the four major questions accounted for a high percentage of points. Bessie finished the computer science paper in only half an hour. The power system engineering and intelligence control papers weren't as tricky in comparison, especially the power system engineering paper. She understood the large power diagrams at a glance. She only spent 40 minutes on those two papers together. After a little over an hour, she had finished those three papers and turned on the computer on the table. Dean Soup, I'm borrowing your computer. Dean Soup was a little stunned. Have you finished writing the other three? How long had she taken? Squinting, Bessie first entered a string of codes to analyze the computer data. She muttered, yeah, and started operating on the computer. Dean Soup's computer only had the office software, so she opened the system editor directly. The question wasn't set on the computer, so she made a semi-completed program according to the question's prompt. Beside her, Dr. Weatherby put down his teacup and walked over to pick up her three papers. They were all fully written. He didn't have time to study the questions and went directly to the assistant for the answers. The assistant had a terrible headache. After finally getting the test papers, he had to search the database for the answer, which he sent to Dr. Weatherby within two minutes. Sitting down, Dr. Weatherby put aside his phone and checked the answers against the test paper without marking it. His expression was extremely calm as he checked the answers. But slowly, his calm demeanor gradually cracked and his casual attitude changed drastically. He started sitting upright. Noticing the change in his attitude, Dean Soup glanced at him inadvertently. Dr. Weatherby? Episode 252, The Computer Science Department's Precious Treasure. Ignoring him, Dr. Weatherby quickly picked up the next test paper and checked the answers to that one, almost without blinking. He became extremely serious and was instantly dumbfounded. Standing up violently, he rechecked the three test papers, one after the other. Taking a deep breath, he picked up his phone and sent a message to the assistant. Are you sure you sent the test papers with the highest percentage of failure? The assistant on the other end of the phone was very young and was previously Dr. Weatherby's apprentice. Thinking he had made a mistake, he replied apprehensively. Yes, are you not satisfied with the difficulty of the questions? Then I'll tell the teachers to make the exams more difficult this year. Dr. Weatherby picked up the computer science paper and looked through the last major question again. It was really not a simple question. The teacher who had written this question had seriously set a trap for the candidates. Northwestern University not only assembled the best students in the country, but the students also excelled among the crowd. The level of difficulty of the papers was certainly not low, given the number of failures. But... Dr. Weatherby was stiff for a while, his mouth hanging open. He reread Bessie's answer. She hadn't made a single mistake. It even made him wonder if she had stolen the answers to the final exam of Northwestern University. At the thought of Bessie's second major, Dr. Weatherby turned his head silently and glanced at her. He felt a little comforted. At least there was computer programming. Among these four courses, she was the best at computer programming. The programming was basically an introduction for freshmen, so it was only a matter of hand speed for Bessie. It had taken Dr. Weatherby nearly 20 minutes to ask for and compare the answers. In that time, Bessie had already restored the test papers on the computer and had completed the questions. Putting the mouse aside, she stood up and glanced at Dr. Weatherby. Dr. Weatherby, I'm done. Dr. Weatherby was stunned. You're also done with the programming. Nodding, Bessie pushed out her chair. She stepped aside and let Dr. Weatherby come over to take a look. Dr. Weatherby put down the test papers and his phone and walked over. 
He glanced at the completed answer on the programming question. They all had offices, so of course he knew that the offices didn't have such a system. Staring at this scene, he was momentarily silent. He never imagined things would develop in such a way, nor did he think that Bessie would know computer programming. Most importantly, it wasn't just surface-level knowledge. Dr. Weatherby's expression was unpredictable. Leaning on the table, Bessie folded her arms and raised an eyebrow. She thought for a while and said, How about this? If you think it's not enough, you can give me the papers for the other courses. No! Dr. Weatherby suddenly sobered up. Enough. It's completely enough. You don't have to do the other test papers. He looked seriously at her. You want to study nuclear engineering, right? Okay, you can. I'll approve it for you. Come to me to get a report when school starts. However, you'll have to participate in the activities for computer science. That goes without saying. Bessie smiled lazily. You can go. At a loss for words, Dr. Weatherby just waved her away. Remember to report to school on time. Seeing that they had settled the matter, Michael put down the cup in his hand and got up. He politely bid farewell to Dean Soup. Carry on with your work. We'll take our leave first. Dean Soup didn't know why Dr. Weatherby's attitude had suddenly changed, but it went without saying that Bessie had done well. Getting up, he waited for them to leave before walking back into his office and asking Dr. Weatherby, What happened? How did she do? The computer screen was still showing the programming. Dean Soup belonged to the Department of Science and Technology, but had never studied programming before. He glanced at him and continued asking, Did she complete the computer programming test too? I'll let the teachers from other programming majors in the Science and Technology Department take a look later. Rooted to the spot and deep in thought, Dr. Weatherby suddenly reacted after hearing Dean Soup. Don't! Don't send it to them! He exclaimed, floundering. Dean Soup was taken aback, and the cup in his hand almost fell. W why He asked. Why? Dr. Weatherby glanced at Dean Soup, unable to express his pain. Don't you know that there's no examination system on our computer? Dean Soup nodded. Of course he knew that. But you didn't realize that she moved the examination system from the Academic Affairs Office's computer to your computer? Dr. Weatherby pointed to the answer sheet on the computer blankly. He had just read the test paper and knew that half of the programming questions needed to be written by a teacher. Bessie's was complete. She was only a freshman who had not enrolled yet but she had easily copied the test program from the Educational Administrative System to Dean Soup's computer, if the other professors were to find out about this. After listening to Dr. Weatherby, Dean Soup was speechless. What? Without uttering a single word, he just reacted sternly and coldly deleted Bessie's test paper page. As for her scores on the test papers, did he need to mark the papers of someone who could hack the educational administrative system of Northwestern University? Dr. Weatherby put away the three papers blankly. Meanwhile, Bessie, Michael, and the others left the school. It was the afternoon, and it just happened to be lunchtime. They were preparing to have their meal. Marvin had already booked a hotel restaurant in advance. At this moment, they all sat inside a room. Marvin hung the parasol at the side. Tucker held his phone, his gaze following Marvin's hand as he put down the parasol. Marvin noticed his stare and asked, Do you need something? Looking away, Tucker shook his head coldly. Mr. Miller, are you planning to stay in Evanston for a while this time? Michael poured James a cup of tea, his eyes lowered and his tone very polite. James had a very good impression of this young man and didn't see him as an outsider. He thought for a while and cleared his throat. It seems my family had found me. Your family? Michael looked up. I was abducted and taken to Fairfield when I was a kid. James didn't feel the need to hide the truth from Michael. He held his teacup and fell deep in thought. Two months ago, someone from my family discovered me in Fairfield. 
He didn't know the details, except that they had told him to come to Evanston first. Glancing at Bessie, he stammered in a low voice, Bessie, are you willing to... No. Propping her chin with one hand and turning on her phone with the other, she flatly rejected him before he could finish his sentence. James had already expected this result. Bessie hadn't been close to him when she was young, as he had paid more attention to Anne. But now... He sighed inwardly and stopped talking. Mr. Miller, where are you staying now? Michael could tell that Bessie was rather indifferent to James, but was much friendlier towards her brother. James returned to his senses. I don't know. It'll take a while for my uncle to contact me. Nodding, Michael leaned back in his chair and placed his hands on the armrests. He glanced at Bessie and smiled. You can send me a Twitter message once you've confirmed the address. They had already added each other on Twitter. James picked up the fork. Okay. On good terms, the two of them drank a little bit of wine during the meal and chattered incessantly. James talked most of the time while Michael listened. Bessie had learned her lesson from last time and didn't let them drink too much this time. Even after finishing their meal, James's Uncle Jack had yet to contact him. Bessie knocked on the table impatiently and turned to ask Tucker, What's the matter with Uncle Jack? I don't know. Tucker's head was lowered as he played the minigame on his phone, and he only looked up when Bessie asked him a question. She wanted to say something else, but the phone in James's pocket finally rang. The uncle he talked about had finally called. On the phone, Uncle Jack asked James for the address, but he subconsciously glanced at Michael questioningly. Michael filled him in. Once he hung up, he stood up and said to Michael, You don't have to wait with me. Uncle Jack will arrive soon. Michael glanced at Bessie. Losing patience from the long wait, she lowered her head and was slowly peeling off a lollipop wrapper. They went downstairs. The sky wasn't completely dark yet, but the street lights had already been turned on. James stood under a street lamp and waved them away. Go ahead, there are many mosquitoes on the roadside. Okay, be careful by yourself. Michael bid farewell to him politely. We'll leave first. After confirming that Uncle Jack was coming to pick James up, Michael and Bessie left first without waiting. Standing under the street lamp, James looked down at Tucker. He was still playing his game. He pursed his lips and said, Tucker, you must remember your sister if you become rich in the future. Still fixated on his game, Tucker muttered, Okay. I know you often skipped classes to go to your sister's school when you were young. James reached out to pat his head, then sighed and stopped talking. Tucker paused. Since he was young, he had often heard that he was identical to his sister. So, he had often skipped classes just to go to Fairfield Middle School to see his sister that everyone talked about. As they talked, a car slowly stopped beside them. Just them? An old man with slightly gray hair sitting in the passenger seat squinted his eyes and sized up the two of them, his voice very cold. The middle-aged man in the driver's seat nodded. The old man looked away disappointedly. He doesn't have the slightest demeanor of our boss. Tell them to get in the car first. We'll head to Park Place Apartments before going back. The middle-aged man said, I heard he also has two daughters. Don't bother. The old man waved his hand. His tone was dull, and he looked indifferent. There's no need. The middle-aged man said no more and opened the door for James. Episode 253 Full Marks Hacking the System Along the Way At the same time, Anne returned to the Perez family's house. She wasn't in the right state of mind today and was beside herself. Grandpa Perez and the others were waiting for her. He smiled inadvertently at the sight of her and asked in a gentle voice, Anne, how was today's exhibition? It was okay. Clenching the fork in her hand, Anne looked down and avoided Elise and the other's gaze. I knew it, Elise smiled. 
Anne is the only level six violinist. She must be number one this time. Anne's grip tightened around the fork. She had done her utmost trying to win the spot in Austria and had even changed her exhibition pass regardless of Mr. Grint to impress Mr. Engel. She originally thought that she would crush Bessie beneath her feet and display a breathtaking performance now that she was in level six. Who would have thought that Bessie could reach level seven so easily? She had suffered a crushing defeat in this exhibition and her assessment result was even similar to Henson's. At level seven, she could even apply as a teacher and accept students in the association. The sixth and seventh levels were critical junctures, but no matter how confident Anne was, she didn't think she could reach level seven within a year. This gap couldn't be made up for with time. Thinking of what she once said to Bessie, she was at a loss as to how to describe her current emotions. Failing to notice her misplaced expression, Elise continued smiling. Anne, shouldn't you post something on Twitter? You haven't posted a video for almost half a month. Your fans are urging you. Anne had always run her Twitter well and usually had people helping her to film videos. Because she was good looking and talented, she had attracted a large fan base. She had also posted her final exam results. After surpassing 10 million fans on Twitter and approaching 12 million now, she had become a popular influencer. Various advertisers contacted her every day, but she didn't value those advertisements and had never paid attention to them. She had even written a post on her Twitter. I only focus on music, I don't do advertisements. She had attracted many fans because of this. I know. I'll post it right after going upstairs, she said, nodding. She had no appetite and only took a few bites before getting up. I'm going upstairs to practice. Upstairs, she returned to her room and flipped through her phone inventory. She chose a video and posted it on Twitter. After a while, various notifications followed. She clicked on the comment page and saw a comment that was most liked and popular. Little Woodfish had said, Ah, oh, she's my favorite account. She actually knows how to do the overtone. On the other end of this Twitter exchange, the user watched Anne's video several times before reluctantly putting down her phone. Before long, her friend sent her another post. Look at this. This young lady on the hot search is better than the violinist you follow, right? She suspiciously clicked on the link and opened Twitter to see a video of a girl she had never seen before playing the violin. She fell in love from the tense opening and was heartily engrossed in the various techniques that followed, one after another. However, halfway through, she turned off the video and read the description on the post. It said the piece was an original composition. She narrowed her eyes and left an angry message. Little Woodfish posted, Excuse me, blogger, why does this person's original composition sound like Anne's video in her early days? Little Woodfish was a college student and had followed Anne last year because of her viral violin video. She studied music and rarely saw violin masters of Anne's level who knew all kinds of violin techniques create a Twitter account. Not only was she good looking, but she was also a good violin player and also a student at Northwestern University. How could she not draw fans to her? Little Woodfish was one of her most loyal fans. Hence, she very clearly remembered this song to be Anne's audition song last year. However, her comments were buried under all the others and made no splash. She originally wanted to forward it to others, but as a big fan, after seeing popular comments about Anne, she didn't want to draw hatred towards her without any evidence. Thinking about it, she saved the other violin video and then began to transcribe the scores. She would use the comparison as evidence. Bessie went upstairs directly to pick up Scarlett's video call when she returned to the Highline Apartments. She, Scarlett, Paul, and Mary had all been admitted to Northwestern University's dual enrollment program. Bright Bow High School had given them the nickname Northwestern University's Four Scholars. Mary had arrived a month ago while Paul and Scarlett would come tomorrow and then sign up the day after tomorrow. Bessie's violin practice would be temporarily put on hold, so she confirmed their arrival time tomorrow. The four of them started a group video chat. 
Scarlet was still wearing black-rimmed glasses. She pushed her glasses up and spoke in a very soft voice. I'll arrive with Mr. Grant and the others tomorrow at around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Only a few flights flew from Chicago to Evanston every day. Paul seemed to be on the sofa downstairs. He scratched his head and moved closer to the camera. I'll arrive at noon tomorrow. I'll pick you guys up. Mary was a little cocky after finding out that Bessie had helped her reach such a high level in the game. She played games every day now and said excitedly at this moment, Come on, let's meet for a game. Knowing that they would arrive tomorrow, Bessie's mood improved. She sat at the table, leaning back in her chair, and turned her computer on casually. The computer page still had no icons. She clicked a few keys and a file library appeared, in which she found the file that Jared had given her last time. The forces investigating her were mainly the Flake family and Evanston Research Institute's Northwestern Memorial Hospital. Tapping the tabletop, she squinted at Evanston Research Institute Northwestern Memorial Hospital. She would have to find time to visit 129 headquarters. Downstairs, Marvin was about to carry the flower pot upstairs. Then, the doorbell rang. Putting down the flower pot, he went to open the door. Several guests often came to the Highline Apartments. Joshua would come to have a cup of tea every few days, while Rosemary would come and wander around when she was free. Patrick had said he would come around at this time. Marvin opened the door and expected to see Patrick and the others. Unexpectedly, he was greeted with an unfamiliar face. The man was tall, dressed in loose casual clothes, and held a delicate bag in his hand. He smiled at Marvin, like a bright moon, pure and clean. Excuse me, is Bessie asleep? Firstly, he didn't address her as Miss Miller. Secondly, he only asked if she was sleeping, as if he was certain that she lived here. An alarm rang in Marvin's mind and he received these two signals. Bessie's practicing the violin upstairs. I see. The other party didn't say much and just smiled. His cold demeanor seemed to melt. And he reached out to hand the bag to Marvin. Can I trouble you to pass this to her? He didn't ask if he could come in and find Bessie and his tone was very soothing. Marvin felt like his manner was much better than Michael's. You are... Marvin took the bag. He didn't dare reject Bessie's thing. No need. She'll know who I am. The man turned to leave and entered the elevator. Once his figure had disappeared completely before his eyes, Marvin took the bag and walked into the apartment very suspiciously. He saw Michael coming downstairs at a glance. Michael. He greeted him and stood upright. Yeah? Although Michael had drunk that night, he wasn't drunk and only smelled a little of alcohol. He had taken a shower before coming down and was wearing cotton pajamas that made him look much softer. Who was it? He poured a glass of water in the kitchen before noticing the delicate little bag in Marvin's hand. The bag looked very empty, but in the lower left corner, a logo similar to a certain flower was printed inconspicuously. He leaned against the stairs and raised an eyebrow lightly. Marvin said nervously, It was a gentleman. I asked him who he was, but he didn't answer. He said that Bessie would know who he was. Once she saw the bag, he seemed very familiar with her. Marvin had become calmer and calmer after following Bessie for so long. After all, he had seen too many people turn out to know Bessie, not to mention heavyweights like Michael. The room seemed to fall into an extremely strange silence as he waited for Michael's reply. He scratched his head. Michael? Give me the bag. He reached out his hand slowly. Marvin immediately handed him the bag. Michael took hold of it and examined it. There was something in the bag, but it wasn't very heavy, about the weight of a small teacup. Without digging through the bag, he just looked down at it before taking another sip of water and then walking upstairs unhurriedly. He stopped outside of Bessie's door and knocked on it. Bessie had just hung up the video call with Paul and the others. She went to get the things from her backpack and opened the door on her way. Michael was leaning against the doorframe, playing lazily with the bag in his slender hands. Bessie knew what it was as soon as she saw the bag. She turned and continued packing up her black backpack. 
Then she sat down in front of the computer, not caring too much. Aren't you curious about what gift this is? Michael walked inside, his curiosity slightly piqued. He handed the bag to her, then rested one hand on the table beside her casually. Bessie took out a notebook from her backpack. Looking up at him, she reached out to take the bag. She knew what was inside and wasn't curious. As soon as she reached for it, Michael raised his hand a little higher. Bessie was sitting on a stool while he was leaning against the table, so she couldn't reach his height even if she tried. She nodded. Okay, fine. I'll give it to you. She didn't want it? Episode 254 James's Hidden Identity Michael looked down. Judging by her words, he had also guessed what was inside and looked down to see a black cell phone. Oh. Bessie closed the files on her computer and pressed a few keys to open the social network software. Big brother. Brother, I'll give it to you, okay? She said perfunctorily. Michael stared down at her. Her eyebrows were calm, and her tone was casual. He suddenly laughed. No, wait, what did you just call me? Brother? Bessie didn't even look up. Before that. His good-looking eyebrows were lowered. Bessie thought about it, tilted her head and supported her chin. Big brother? Chuckling, Michael stared at her mysteriously, and then handed her the bag. Take it. Don't you want it? Bessie took the bag. This phone is pretty useful. No need. Michael stood upright. I heard Patrick and the others. I'm going downstairs now. Downstairs, Marvin just sat on the sofa while holding the flower pot. His desire for survival prevented him from following Michael upstairs. He first sent a message to Mary to report the status of the flower. Then, he sent it to the old gardener. The old gardener would usually reply indifferently, but today, he suddenly replied, I think you have potential in growing flowers. Staring at the message for a long time, Marvin still couldn't figure out what he meant. The doorbell rang at this time. Patrick and the others had finally arrived. Taking off his suit jacket, he was about to head upstairs. Where's Michael? Rosemary followed behind him. He's probably talking to Bessie, Marvin warned. Rosemary came down immediately and didn't dare go upstairs. She sat down opposite Marvin. She placed her briefcase on the table casually and crossed her legs. Marvin glanced at her briefcase. There was also a flower logo in the lower left corner of the bag. The pattern was unique. Marvin usually didn't pay attention to Patrick and the others, but in the past six months, he had been surrounded by flowers and was particularly concerned about them. He found the flower on the briefcase very familiar. I just saw this flower on your bag, he said, pointing at Rosemary's bag. Hearing this, Rosemary lowered her head and glanced at her briefcase. She folded her arms and raised an eyebrow. Where? She didn't sound particularly interested. This was a briefcase issued by the World Poker Tour. Large and small businesses had been attracted to the World Poker Tour's bid today. Although it was their first time taking part in the electronic product business, no one was worried that the project wouldn't succeed. The logo had only just been registered by them and had not been released on the market. Michael walked slowly down the stairs. Marvin caught a glimpse of him and was so frightened he shut up immediately. He no longer said a word and didn't want to play around anymore, so he walked upstairs with the flower pot to find Bessie. He moved quickly, like a gust of wind. Patrick was stunned. The speed at which Marvin moved wasn't normal. Why were you looking for me? Michael sat on the sofa, looking down and straightening the sleeves of his pajamas. He leaned against the back of the sofa and spoke with a loose and relaxed tone. Rosemary was still staring at Marvin's back, deep in thought. She looked away when she heard Michael and threw a folder onto the table. Take a look. Michael picked it up. He saw the logo on the document at a glance and raised an eyebrow. You went to bid today? How did you know? Rosemary sighed, but since she was accustomed to Michael being more well-informed than her, she didn't make a fuss. Indeed, after all, countless people want a piece of that. 
The World Poker Tour was a big corporation in America, and there were only four people who would compete with them as an economic lifeline. This was their first time entering Evanston, so beyond Rosemary and the others. The major powers of Evanston also all hoped for their successful establishment. It could ultimately drive Evanston's economic growth. Rosemary had to grasp such an opportunity. I didn't really touch on this aspect previously. I heard it's an intelligence system that the head of the World Poker Tour is involved in, mainly through artificial intelligence and cell phones. Rosemary put her hands on the table and turned to ask Michael, Help me analyze the situation. Do I have a chance? Michael turned a few pages and replied unceremoniously, Zero. I thought so too. Rosemary wasn't annoyed and just squinted her eyes. But the World Poker Tour's movement this time is really a little overwhelming. Their entrance in the mobile IT market would usher a huge transformation, and her company had only just emerged after all. Hence, they weren't as rich as those families in Evanston, nor as skilled and specialized in electronic products. In this aspect, they weren't even up to par with a small group specializing in the IT industry. Unless help fell from the sky, it was impossible. They had a lot of bids. Patrick stayed seated on the sofa and turned to ask Rosemary once she and Michael had finished talking. Definitely. Rosemary crossed her legs and spoke with certainty. I'm very sure it's someone very important in the IT industry. When she went for the bidding today, most of the IT companies had been discussing the main figures. She wasn't well-versed in the IT industry, but from their enthusiasm, she could tell that those bosses weren't simple. Nodding, Patrick pondered for a moment and then remained silent. After a long while, Rosemary felt a little disappointed and wanted to go find Bessie. Is Bessie still practicing the violin upstairs? No, she's working on other things. Michael was expressionless and only replied perfunctorily. Okay, she glanced upstairs regretfully. Then I won't disturb her. Upstairs, Bessie put the flower pot that Marvin had brought her on the windowsill. Then she logged into her account on the computer and pressed a few keys. It went directly to a video call. Although it was late at night, the other party still picked up quickly. A middle-aged man appeared on the screen. He was in his study holding his teacup and staring at her, calm and unruffled. Bessie, is it my turn? Reaching out for the paper bag on the table, Bessie smiled. Yes, that's right. It was Jared on the screen. Are you serious? He sat upright immediately. He had already waited for Bessie for two long months. Flipping through the small bag, Bessie took out the black mobile phone from inside. Would I joke with you? She said without lifting her head. Okay. Jared stood up with his hands on the table. Go ahead. Where can I see you tomorrow? I'll set the time and place, or do you want to do that? No need. Bessie pressed the power button and waited for the cell phone to load. She looked up at him. I'll go to the headquarters directly tomorrow and check on some information as well. Anything you want. It didn't matter if she was coming in passing, as long as it was his turn. I'm just informing you. Bessie glanced at the phone. The system had already indicated that the loading was complete. She said calmly, I'm hanging up first. She hung up the video call before looking at the new black phone. This was a prototype design she had given the World Poker Tour before returning from Austria. Its content was a little complicated, so the World Poker Tour had taken two months to develop it. The phone was extremely slim and could hardly be felt in her hand. Bessie took a piece of paper from the bag. It was white paper with a line of words written on it. It stated that the phone had yet to be named and that there was only a Poppy Flower logo. If it had a name, it would be named Poppy. Furthermore, the World Poker Tour wanted to develop a line of Poppy logos on the EA series of robots in addition to those on the mobile phones. It was just that the cost of the robots was high and the technology was complicated. The World Poker Tour hadn't released the sale to the public yet, and it was still in the research and development stage. Hence, they had released the mobile phone first. Smiling, Bessie folded the paper and put it into the drawer. 
She then tried out the new cell phone. Please perform pupil authentication. Though virtual, it was still a very mechanical sound. After authenticating her identity, she connected to the internet and opened a web page casually. With a flick of her hand, the web page spread like a layer of information and cast a virtual projection in front of her. The color theme of the page was blue. The opened web page was also the intelligent information network of the World Poker Tour. Leaning back in her chair, Bessie rested her chin in her hand and watched the virtual projection. Then, she thought about it and took out the heavy black cell phone from her backpack. She threw it onto the table. Look, your younger brother. She said to the phone. The black phone didn't light up and only buzzed twice, as if it was protesting. Bessie ignored it and placed it aside. She got out of her pajamas and went to take a bath. She closed the bathroom door. Two minutes later, the heavy black phone lit up. At the same time, in Jared's house. He lived in the city center and had bought the highest floor. Standing by the floor-to-ceiling window, he had a bird's-eye view of the hustle and bustle of the city. But he was obviously not interested in that at this time. He'd come out of the study to pour himself another glass of water. After taking a sip, he sat on the sofa and calmed himself down. He suddenly thought of something and sent another message to Bessie. Can I tell the others? He was naturally talking about the founders of 129. Other than he and Clarissa, the other founders didn't know about Bessie. After all, she was too young. After a while, he received a one-word reply. Okay. Jared immediately switched his account and clicked into a group chat. The lone wolf will come to the headquarters tomorrow. Who is nearby? Slag Dragon replied with a series of messages. Boss, did you say the wrong name? The Lone Wolf? What the fuck? Question mark, explanation mark. And then he sent a shocked face emoji. Episode 255. A Mysterious Gift with the World Poker Tour's logo. It wasn't the Slag Dragon's fault for being shocked. 129 was most famous for the five veterans, and among them... Only the lone wolf had successfully reached the pinnacle of the business without any failure. It was very simple. The ranking among them was obvious. Even Matthew from the CIA had asked for the lone wolf to take his order. Of course, the most straightforward reason for this was that only the lone wolf was a hacker. The other four had all met in private and were very familiar with each other. But apart from taking orders, the lone wolf didn't expose his name let alone meet them in real life. But he suddenly said he would visit the 129 headquarters. So of course, the Slag Dragon had almost exploded with this information. Jared replied, I'll mute you if you keep spamming. Morning Bird sent a message. I have an interview outside the city, but I'm coming back tomorrow afternoon. Giant Crocodile also replied, Lone Wolf? My brother is in Evanston. Why didn't he tell me? I'm at the border. Is he really coming? Slag Dragon sent one last message. I'm not in Evanston either, but I can rush over tonight. Okay, bye. I have to drive over now. Slag Dragon went offline. Giant Crocodile was very depressed. 129 is so lively. I also want to see my brother. Morning Bird replied. Dot, dot, dot. These veterans all knew that three years ago, Giant Crocodile had almost been caught by Matthew during a terrorist transaction at the border. If it hadn't been for Lone Wolf, Jared and Giant Crocodile's subordinates might have to go to the CIA prison to rescue him. Since then, Lone Wolf had been the unilateral big brother of Giant Crocodile. Jared sent another message. Don't come. If you do, the bosses will definitely know. There's too much movement. Giant Crocodile sent a sad message. Dot, dot, dot. Jared replied, You should be well aware of your business, no? You still want Lone Wolf to save your life? In Boston, Clarissa looked at the chat group and chuckled. Morning Bird had just sent, As far as I know, the big boss in charge of the three major pathways, the water, land, and air, is in Evanston. Believe it or not, the moment you get on your private jet, you'll be shot down without flying over the border. 
Clarissa had recently come in contact with this matter and found a lot of information about an important person with control over the three pathways as well as his activities in Evanston in recent years. She was certain that this person was from Evanston, but she didn't know who it was. He was hidden as deep as their lone wolf. Giant Crocodile still prioritized his little life. I think I'll just invite my big brother to the border someday. Clarissa glanced at the reply and snorted slightly. Giant Crocodile was almost on two extreme ends in real life and on the internet. She put down her phone. A girl beside her glanced at her. Clarissa, can we knock off work? Clarissa nodded and took her backpack. Yes, there's one last report. You guys can make a trip there. I have to return to Evanston for something. She grabbed her car key and left directly. Not long after she left, a tall and slender man came out of the gate and was quickly surrounded by a group of reporters. Chairman Ash. Santiago's dark eyes swept across the crowd. He couldn't help frowning when he couldn't see the familiar figure he was looking for in the crowd. After dealing with the reporters along with the developer, he sat in his car. Chairman Ash, you have a phone call. His secretary sat in the passenger seat and held out his phone. Santiago frowned. Don't pick it up. The secretary lowered his voice. It's Miss Flake. Santiago paused and reached for the phone, his expression calming down. The next day, Joshua came to the Highline Apartments early in the morning and sat at the breakfast table. He ate breakfast with Bessie and the others, and both his expression and condition looked good. Michael had just finished his morning run and was coming downstairs. Bessie. Marvin ate a piece of bread and asked, How come you're so impressive even though you don't train every day? He had never seen Bessie go on a morning run before. Bessie picked up the milk beside her and said casually, Who knows? Marvin was speechless. When Michael came down after his shower, she had already finished eating and sat lazily playing with her phone. Tucker had failed to pass his minigame level even after three days, so Bessie was recording her screen for him. She was using her new cell phone. It was extremely thin. Michael pulled the stool beside her and sat down. He glanced at her mobile phone, then lazily reached out and took a piece of bread. His phone rang and he picked it up. After listening to the person on the other end, he glanced at Bessie. It's Mr. Grint. He's asking if you would like to undertake advanced studies. Advanced studies? Bessie was still looking down at her screen recording. Joshua was also sitting nearby. He was drinking tea after his meal and pricked his ears at the sound of Michael's voice. Austria's Violin Association, said Michael. No, Bessie knew about this. She guessed that she had probably won first place but she was still looking down in disinterest as she replied. Let Henson go. Michael politely passed on this message to Mr. Grint. Then he hung up the phone. When Joshua heard about Austria, the hand holding his teacup paused and he glanced at Bessie. Bessie, why won't you go to Austria? Austria is developing rather well, actually. If you go to Austria Association, you'll surely go to the Vienna University of Music and Performing Arts. Standing beside him, Simons nodded like a woodpecker. Sitting across from him, Marvin glanced over. Simons gritted his teeth. Again? Bessie cleared the level and finished recording the screen. She saved the video, then sent it to Tucker. Then she glanced at Joshua and sat upright subconsciously. Austria is too small. Joshua originally wanted to explain how Austria would be beneficial for her development, but he paused when he heard this. What did you say? Austria isn't as big as Chicago. It's too small, Bessie explained. Austria was an international financial development center. A few major forces were stationed there, providing a prosperous and burgeoning economy. There wasn't much room for expansion, but even so, its size was not something an ordinary city could compare to, and the degree of prosperity was extremely high as well. So far, Joshua had never heard anyone use small to describe Austria. He stared at her in a daze. It's, it's indeed not big. Simons glanced at Bessie. Suddenly, 
He felt like she had the same unruly temperament as their Michael. Who dared to call Austria small? After their meal, Joshua and Michael took Bessie to the shopping mall to help her buy some school necessities. In the past, others in the Clark family had prepared all of Rosemary and Michael's things. It was the first time Joshua had come to a shopping mall for this kind of thing. Michael wasn't someone who frequented the shopping malls either. As for Bessie, there were too many people in the mall. She would have rather gone to the street stores for clothes like how Clarissa did. In the end, Simons came forward and resolved the awkward situation. After buying a series of things, he asked the Clark family's chauffeur to return to the apartment. Bessie, Michael, and the others went to the restaurant upstairs for lunch. After lunch, Bessie planned to go to 129 to see Jared. A friend? Joshua nagged. Where? Is it safe to go alone? Bessie told him where the place was. Joshua nodded. Then let the chauffeur drive you there. Once Bessie left, Joshua narrowed his eyes. He had been in Evanston for decades and naturally knew Evanston's locales. Wasn't Bessie talking about the Black Market Street? Hardly any forces controlled that place. Is it okay for Bessie to go there alone? Joshua glanced at Michael and suddenly flared up. Why didn't you accompany her? For the first time in 20 years, Joshua was angry with his son. Michael was speechless. Marvin drank a sip of water silently. He didn't say anything and just worried about Michael instead. His family status was disconcerting. In Evanston, on the Black Street, Bessie got out of the car and told the chauffeur to leave. She lowered her peak cap and put on a mask. While sending a message to Jared, she walked towards 129's headquarters. On Twitter, she had just received a thank you emoticon from Henson. Jared had been waiting for Bessie's news. When he saw her, he bolted out of his chair and dialed his phone before walking out. Director Covington? Someone downstairs exclaimed. It was the first time they had seen such an expression on the usually cold-hearted and impartial Director Covington. Jared nodded at them, then walked through the glass door and stood in the front gate. Before long, he saw a figure wearing a white t-shirt with a cap lowered on her head and a mask over her mouth. Although her face couldn't be seen clearly, her temperament couldn't be concealed. Her unique coldness was tinged with laziness, just as Jared had imagined. He waved at her. Over here. He took her upstairs, opened the door, and pressed the elevator button for her. His attitude surprised the ordinary members on the first floor. When the elevator door closed, the members on the first floor exchanged glances. Was that Director Covington just now? The ordinary members rarely saw Jared and the others and had only seen his photo on 129's internal website. Yes. Sherry stopped staring and took a deep breath. It's really Director Covington. The newbies were extremely excited. Who was the woman beside him? Director Covington was particularly polite to her. Sherry had a relatively high level of prestige among these ordinary members, so everyone turned to look at her subconsciously. She's probably a founding member. Morning Bird, maybe? I didn't expect her to be so young. Sherry put down the phone and laughed. The others nodded. Yeah, it's probably her. Out of 129's founding members, Lone Wolf and Giant Crocodile were the most mysterious. Everyone knew that Giant Crocodile was a man, but they didn't know Lone Wolf's gender. They only had more information on Morning Bird. The group of newbies continued discussing fiercely, but Sherry stared at the elevator again. Episode 256, The Five Founding Members Upstairs, Bessie took off her mask and peaked cap when she entered the office. Her eyes scanned the office before finally resting on the computer at the desk. I'll use your computer. Even though he had video called her several times, Jared still felt a big impact when he saw Bessie's face. He stopped at the door and his phone rang. Looking down at it, Jared turned it off and turned to look at her. You can use it however you want. I have to go down and pick someone up. Bessie knew that Clarissa wouldn't pick the other members up, so she pulled out the chair and sat down casually before looking up curiously. 
Who is it? Smiling mysteriously, Jared simply said, You'll know when he comes up. He opened the door and left, closing it behind him. After Jared left, Bessie opened the 129 website. The page was full of internal material that couldn't be transcribed and required the authority of a senior member to access. Jared's account was automatically logged in. Since she was just checking some information, she didn't log into her own account. She simply typed a line in the search bar. Evanston First Research Institute. 129 had very complete data, extending from a basic introduction of the people in the First Research Institute to the several projects being mastered inside. The Research Institute was one of the four major forces in Evanston. These forces stood almost at the top of the social circle and were controlled by the four major families. Behind the First Research Institute was the White Family. Their main research was nuclear power engineering and nuclear energy but there were many other branches. These included experimental research and mechanical design of various nuclear technologies. The science and technology departments of Northwestern University and the University of Chicago were under the first research institute. Every year, these two universities would fiercely compete to attract the most talent. They wanted their school to be ranked higher in the world, so the institute's support and allocation of resources was very important. Most of the well-known professors in the science and technology departments of Northwestern University and the University of Chicago were engaged in projects for the Research Institute. The Institute would also send more qualified professors to the two colleges to teach the talented students in various fields. Bessie scrolled down and found who the dean of the Evanston First Research Institute was. Arnold Fielder. Her fingers tightened around the mouse at this name. After a long while, she skipped past several years to check things that had happened decades ago. But the internet had not been as developed a few decades ago, so most of the Research Institute's information was in the archives. The first Research Institute probably had a large database. However, 129 was founded less than 10 years ago, so it could only trace back to incidents that happened 20 years ago at most. Downstairs, Jared came out of the 129 building. Not long after Jared walked out, a red sports car roared over from the corner of the street. Its wheels screeched harshly against the road as it came to a stop. The man in the driver's seat took off his sunglasses and, instead of opening the door, just rolled down the window and put his hand out. He was wearing a t-shirt with a skull printed on it and a pair of ripped jeans. It wasn't Slag Dragon's first time to 129, nor was it the first time he'd seen Jared. He noticed Jared standing at the gate at a glance. Hooking his sunglasses on the neck of his shirt, he waved to Jared and smiled harmlessly. Boss. Jared didn't treat him as gently and politely as he did Lone Wolf. He glanced at him once and said, Come in. His tone was cold and emotionless. Dragging his feet in a pair of slippers, Slag Dragon lazily followed behind him. At this time, a few rookies on the first floor had yet to leave. Slag Dragon looked around at the newbies and noticed an especially beautiful woman among them. His eyes lit up and he paused to greet her. Hello. Jared ignored him and just pressed the elevator button. He immediately hurried in. Naturally, the group of newbies on the first floor had never seen Slag Dragon before. But since he was walking with Jared, he was at least a veteran member, if not one of the core members. I'll be satisfied if I ever get promoted to an intermediate member, let alone a senior member, an ordinary member said enviously. Miss Flake, are you reaching that level soon? Someone asked Sherry. Inside the elevator, Slag Dragon asked, Boss, is Lone Wolf here? Is he in your office? Slag Dragon put his hands in his pockets and glanced sideways at Jared. He was talkative and couldn't stop asking questions. How old is he this year? He's probably older than me, right? But since he's so cool, he's definitely younger than you. Around 30 or 40? Is he as indifferent and boring as Giant Crocodile in real life? Is he very scary? Boss, why aren't you speaking? Most of the five founding members of 129 were relatively calm. 
Bessie was also steady and calm despite her young age, though of course, it was another matter when she was irritated. Meanwhile, perhaps because of the environment she grew up in, Clarissa was the most stable one. Although Giant Crocodile was very talkative online, he was relatively cold in real life. Only Slag Dragon was like this. Jared really didn't know why this member was so talkative around other people. He was more annoying than Sparrows. Ding! The elevator door opened. Jared got out and immediately felt like the air was fresher. Boss, your expression is scaring me. Boss, why didn't you reply to me? Jared quickened his pace. He walked to the office door and opened it directly. Slag Dragon followed him. He had been to Jared's office several times and was familiar with the place. He immediately glanced at the empty sofa. Boss, Lone Wolf. Halfway through his sentence, he suddenly stopped and stared at the person sitting at Jared's desk. Jared closed the door, ignoring him. He glanced at Bessie and asked, Have you found the information? Almost. Bessie leaned back in the chair. Her legs crossed casually. She rested one hand behind her head and said calmly, The first research institute had a fault ten years ago. Jared wasn't surprised. It wasn't easy for 129 to find out details from 10 years ago. Even the other three big families didn't know the details of the first research institute from 10 years ago. While talking, Jared poured two glasses of water, one for himself and one for Bessie. He then introduced her to the other man. He's Slag Dragon. Although Slag Dragon was a chatterbox, he was still intelligent as a member of 129. Seeing Bessie in the boss's chair, he guessed her identity. Staring at her face that seemed too young, as if she was still in high school, he finally found his voice and asked, Lone Wolf? Bessie put her chin in her hand. A skull top, ripped trousers, and slippers. It was just as she had imagined. Her beautiful brows twitched slightly and she nodded coldly. How old are you? Slag Dragon asked. 19, Bessie casually replied as she drank a sip of water. Slag Dragon was dumbstruck. For the first time in his life, he didn't know what to say. Based on her attitude, she was indeed Lone Wolf. But not only was she a woman, she was so young and beautiful. 129's veteran corps member was only 19 years old? How could the ordinary rookie members added this year possibly endure this? Slag Dragon scratched his head and took out another cigarette from his pocket. He reflected on life and looked down after a long while. He felt like he was wearing the wrong clothes today. Twenty minutes later, Clarissa had arrived at the office. Slag Dragon whispered quietly in Clarissa's ears, Who would have thought that Lone Wolf was so young and is also a female? Clarissa threw her backpack onto the sofa. She glanced at him and nodded. Lone Wolf probably didn't expect Slag Dragon to be a chatterbox. They had been friends online for a long time, so though this was their first formal meeting, it was comfortable. It had been the same when Bessie first met Clarissa. The four of them sat in the office and chatted for a few hours before Clarissa decided to drive Bessie back. Slag Dragon insisted on following them. He sat in the passenger seat while Bessie sat at the back. Clarissa asked for the address and started driving. Evanston was big, and not only had Clarissa just returned from the border last year, but she also traveled frequently. Hence, she wasn't familiar with Evanston. Slag Dragon continued asking questions. Lone Wolf, why did you suddenly come to find us? You're only 19? Lone Wolf, Giant Crocodile always calls you Big Brother. Lone Wolf... In the back seat, Bessie finally took out her earphones and said, Stop the car, we've arrived. Slag Dragon looked out the window. It was a commercial district, and no residential houses could be seen. He wondered, We've arrived so soon? Glancing in the rearview mirror, Clarissa parked the car on the side of the road. Bessie picked up her peaked cap and got out of the car. At this time, a female voice sounded from Clarissa's car navigation. Turn left at the traffic light 1,000 feet ahead. 
Slag Dragon immediately turned around and thought Bessie had made a mistake. We haven't arrived yet. Lone Wolf, we haven't arrived yet. Get in. Shut up. Bessie put on her hat and glanced over, cold and impatient. I already said this is the place. She turned and walked away. Although Giant Crocodile hadn't come today, news of Jared receiving three people had also reached the ears of a few forces in Evanston. Slake Dragon originally wanted to see Lone Wolf, but now that Clarissa and Bessie were permanently stationed in Evanston, he returned to 129 and asked Jared to help arrange a residence for him as well. Without a sound, Evanston's influential people began to gather. At this time, Grace had just arrived at Evanston Airport. The official registration for Northwestern University would start tomorrow. Grace had spent the summer receiving guests in Chicago. Now that school was about to start, she also came to Evanston to take care of Anne's studies. Episode 257, A Successful Meeting when Grace arrived in Evanston, the Perez family sent someone to receive her very politely. A subordinate of Grandpa Perez's came to pick her up, and unlike the first time she came to Evanston, his attitude was polite and enthusiastic. His enthusiasm was excessive, even more so than when Anne had been accepted by Mr. Anderson last year. Grace was surprised. Madame, we'll drop by the Violin Association to pick up the young lady. The other party said respectfully. He then drove them to the Violin Association. At the Violin Association, Anne was sitting in front of the computer, staring at the rankings on the page for a long time. It wasn't until her phone rang with a call from the Perez family that she returned to her senses. Annoyed, she turned off the computer. She stood up and walked out. In the last two days, people from the Violin Association had mostly been discussing the exhibition. Three of the students were in the limelight, especially Bessie. Anne really didn't want to hear anything about the three of them. She knew that the first place from the exhibition would go to the Austria Association. As soon as she got out of the elevator, she saw a crowd of onlookers gathered in front of the gate, making a ruckus and bustling with excitement. Anne didn't really care about them, but when she turned, she saw Henson and Mr. Angle on the sidewalk. What are they looking at? She wondered suspiciously. Mr. Anderson had introduced Mr. Engel to her, so she naturally knew his identity. But why was Henson with him? She could understand if it was Bessie, but wasn't Henson just a level five student? Anne, Maria shook her head in confusion. They seemed to be talking about the placing. Maria had just joined the association and didn't know much about Austria. Anne felt like she had been stabbed, and her whole heart almost jumped out of her chest. Her voice tightened and even trembled a little. Placing who? Bessie? A veteran student beside them recognized Anne and the others. Hearing that they were all so interested, he immediately turned around excitedly. It's not Bessie, it's Henson. The placing for Austria was originally for Bessie, but I heard that Mr. Grint said she wants to concentrate on her studies so she gave the place to Henson. He stared enviously at Henson. By the way, do you know what kind of place the Austria Association is? Its status in the world is the same as that of the Evanston Association in America, an unshakable authority. Maria didn't know where Austria was, but the veteran student's description of it sounded extraordinary. She glanced at Henson, not knowing if she was more angry or jealous. Anne took a staggering step back. How could she not know what kind of place Austria was? She had been there before and knew a lot more than the veteran students. It was an incarnation of power and now a place she couldn't even go after a year of hard work. But such a place had been given up casually by Bessie. Anne was still thinking crazily when the veteran student followed up. Oh, besides the Austria placing, I heard that Mr. Grint also accepted Ava and Henson as his named apprentices. They're really so goddamn lucky. Beyond receiving the placing from Bessie, Henson was even accepted as an apprentice by Mr. Grint. Also, the veteran continued, glancing at Maria. I heard that Mr. Grint accepted them as apprentices just because they were Bessie's team members. 
You guys are so lucky this year. I should have joined the association two years later. Then I might have had a chance at being in Bessie's group. Even without the placing for Austria, I could at least be named a student of Mr. Grint. As soon as he said this, Amelia, who was already feeling regretful, felt severely stabbed in the heart. Anne didn't want to listen to him further. She picked up her bag and walked out in despair. She was still hung up on the veteran student's words. Two ordinary members could benefit from Bessie like this? Grace spotted Anne from a distance while still in the Perez family's car. She immediately got out of the car and saw that her face was a little pale. She grabbed her arm and looked her up and down nervously. Anne, are you okay? She asked. At the end of August, the weather was still very hot and dry, but Anne felt cold inside. Shaking her head, she got directly into the back seat. They returned to the Perez family's house. Anne was silent along the way. She just looked out the window deep in thought. Grace didn't know what was wrong with her and didn't dare to disturb her, so she just sat beside her silently. When they arrived at the Perez family's house, Grandpa Perez and the others were waiting for them to start dinner. You're back. In front of Grace, Elise was always condescending and had her nose in the air, but she greeted her amiably at this time. This made Grace feel surprised. It was an extremely unfamiliar attitude. What was going on with the Perez family? Did Anne do something else impressive while she was away in Evanston? Anne had no appetite tonight and just shook her head. You guys go and eat. I'm going upstairs to practice the violin. Grace finished the meal under the warm hospitality of the Perez family. She knocked on Anne's door and noticed how her room was furnished even better than the previous time she came. Are you okay? She had brought Anne a plate of food and placed it on the table before looking at her. Anne had just finished taking a shower and was sitting on her chair, drying her hair with a towel. Hearing this, she shook her head. I'm okay. She had a strong heart and acted like nothing was wrong on the surface. Grace stared at her for a long while and let out a sigh of relief after confirming that she was fine. Now, Anne was the only hope left in her life. Hence, one could imagine her concern. Grace sat down on the side of the bed and said suspiciously, Anne, I feel like your aunt and their attitudes are a little strange today. Strange? Wasn't it because they had seen Bessie being accepted by Mr. Grint? Anne's hand tightened around the towel. She looked down and saw that her fingertips had almost pierced her palm. She could almost imagine how the Smith and Perez families would rejoice when Bessie came back. Two days later, Little Woodfish finished transcribing Bessie's violin scores. The frame of Little Woodfish's first score had marked out the climax of Bessie's violin piece. The first time she listened to it, she had been so immersed in the music that she hadn't memorized it well. After listening to it several times, she wrote down the outline and then continued scoring various difficult segments. The more she listened and transcribed, the more amazed she was by Bessie's music. Little Woodfish had already transcribed Anne's music a year ago. After comparing them, she easily discovered that there were indeed several similar segments but Bessie's performance was obviously more magnificent, and the structure of the composition had more scope. As for Anne's performance a year ago, it was nothing special in comparison. If she hadn't suspected plagiarism was involved, Little Woodfish would have easily switched to Bessie's fan base. But comparing the two scores and given the degree of similarity, it simply couldn't be explained by mere coincidence. You can imagine Little Woodfish's inner conflict. Anne was the first influencer she became a fan of, while Bessie was the one she accidentally became a fan of while scoring her music. After a long while, Little Woodfish looked at the Evanston Association's official account and opened a private message to ask, Excuse me, when was the score originally created for the violinist in your latest video? The Evanston Association's Twitter account never responded to her. Staring at the unanswered message on Twitter, Little Woodfish thought for a long time before finally clicking on Anne's private message to ask her about the violin score. Bessie wasn't aware of this, of course. 
She got out of Clarissa's car and took a taxi back to Michael's apartment. This time, the driver was a middle-aged man who spoke very little. Along the way, they only exchanged a few words. Bessie's frown loosened as she glanced at the group chat. Paul Scarlett and the others had already arrived in Evanston. Mary had just let Paul in. They were calling the class representative in the group chat to play games and raise their levels. Joshua hadn't returned to the Clark family's house and instead had stayed on the sofa in Michael's place at the Highline Apartments. He held a cup of tea while frowning solemnly, deep in thought. Rosemary was still sitting next to him on the sofa, with her back straightened. Bessie went to see a friend? What friend? She asked Joshua. Joshua was about to say he didn't ask when Bessie opened the door. Hearing Rosemary's words, she took off her peaked cap and put it aside. A few online friends I know. Online friends? Joshua sat upright and said solemnly, There are many scammers on the internet recently. It's not safe for a girl to meet someone she only knows online. Next time, bring someone along to meet your online friends. Marvin went to the kitchen to bring Bessie a cup of tea, which he placed on the coffee table opposite Joshua. Bessie sat down and picked up the tea. Her tone was rather indifferent as she spoke. It's okay. Everyone was familiar to me. There was a female reporter there that I'd met in Chicago before. Sitting on the other side of the sofa, Marvin had just opened a bottle of cold beer and taken a sip. When he heard Bessie's words, he almost spit it out. That female war zone reporter whose random shot of medicine cost hundreds of thousands of dollars? He remembered the fear of being dominated by Bessie's ordinary friends, previously. Joshua and Rosemary didn't notice Marvin's expression and were still lecturing Bessie not to meet online friends randomly by herself. Bessie listened quietly to them. After talking for about 10 minutes, Michael and Patrick both returned. They stopped their conversation and everyone went to eat at the dining table. While eating, Joshua's cell phone rang. His expression changed after the call. Simons asked, Something happened? Episode 258, The First Research Institute Joshua put down his fork and fell deep in thought while holding his phone. He opened his mouth and was about to say something, but when he saw Bessie, he swallowed his words and shook his head instead. It's nothing serious. Don't worry. He picked up his fork again and continued eating as if nothing was wrong. In the past, Joshua would have found some excuses to stay after eating, but today, he left in a hurry. Rosemary originally had something to discuss with Michael, but seeing how urgently Joshua left, she frowned and caught up to him with her briefcase. Rosemary walked to the elevator and pressed on the ground floor button. She then turned around and asked Joshua, Dad, what happened? Joshua looked up at the red floor numbers on the elevator. There were some changes at 129. Evanston has become more and more unstable in recent years. The World Poker Tour had entered Evanston, and now, changes at 129. Changes? Rosemary looked up in surprise. Unlike the other forces, 129 was very mysterious, and the Clark family had little information on it. Their intelligence network covered almost the whole world, and no one knew how many families' lifelines were in their hands. Joshua walked out immediately once the elevator doors opened. I heard that two founding members came to Evanston today. Sherry saw them. Could it be Giant Crocodile? Rosemary frowned and murmured. How could you put such a dangerous figure in Evanston? I'll go to check the situation first. Joshua stepped beside the car. He put his hand on the door and didn't get in immediately. I heard that Sherry will become an intermediate member of 129 soon. The Miller family has no chance of a comeback. Rosemary knew some information on 129's veteran members. One reason why nobody dared to provoke 129 and why they were able to control so much information was due to their influence and because the few veteran members were particularly scary. 
The four major families in Evanston had heard about Giant Crocodile. He was a weapons dealer on the border. If Sherry really broke into the internal membership, not only would the long-declining Miller family have no chance of success, but even the other families would have to fear the Flake family. At the Park Place Apartments, Tucker watched the video sent by Bessie repeatedly and then sat cross-legged on the sofa to continue the grid game. He put on headphones to isolate himself from the noise. At the dining table not far away, James was talking to Uncle Jack. Uncle Jack handed him a folder. I've already found a school. It's an international elementary school. Tucker will go to elementary school and you will study with me. James took the folder and nodded serenely. He opened it and had a headache after seeing the complicated text inside. Seeing him behave like this, Uncle Jack sighed internally and stood up with his hands on the table. Uncle Jack's eyes wandered around the hall and then fixed on Tucker. What's he doing? The middle-aged man who drove Uncle Jack's car had been following James and Tucker for a few days, afraid that they would cause trouble. Hearing this, he replied in a whisper, I think he's playing a game that his sister gave him. His sister? Uncle Jack couldn't help but massage his temples when he heard this. The middle-aged man could tell that Uncle Jack was feeling very disappointed. Not daring to say anything, he just lowered his head and sighed internally. Uncle Jack had paid a heavy price to find the rightful son of the Miller family. But who knew he would be like this? Since he had been lost when he was young and had never received family training, it was like pushing a baby bird out of its nest and expecting it to be able to fly. Uncle Jack stayed for a while before returning to the Miller family's house. The middle-aged man walked him out. After he left, James stopped forcing himself to look at the numbers. Instead, he walked over to Tucker, squatted down, and whispered, Tucker, your sister will start school tomorrow. Shall we go and visit her? Tucker touched a part of his screen and finally passed the level. Taking out his headphones, his eyes lit up at James's suggestion. Okay. When the middle-aged man returned and heard this, instead of stopping them, he simply ordered solemnly, Sir, don't tell her about your current situation. James had already told her, but he didn't explain this to the middle-aged man and just nodded in a simple-minded way. I know. I'll take you there tomorrow. The middle-aged man glanced at him, thinking that he probably wouldn't spill the beans. Tucker had already opened an app to contact Bessie. The next day was the first day of school at Northwestern University. Bessie went very early. There weren't too many people at the new student orientation when she arrived. Michael stood by the roadside with her suitcase, waiting for her to head to the orientation. Glancing around, Bessie walked over to the nearest table. She stood out like a sore thumb and quickly became the focus of everyone's attention. Several college students surrounded her immediately. Because she had no luggage, they all wanted to volunteer to take her through the formalities. Enough, let me. A gentleman approached Bessie. Miss, you don't have any luggage? The sun was shining brightly overhead. Bessie lowered her cap and said, I do, it's over there. She pointed in Michael's direction. Michael had one hand in his pocket and was sitting lazily on the luggage. He had been waiting for a long time for her. Since it was summer, he was wearing a black t-shirt that reflected against his white collarbone. While dangling his legs lazily, his looks attracted the attention of students walking past. Taken aback at first, the boy then laughed. He said, Then that's easier for me. He then took her through the formalities. He snorted inwardly. She was so good looking. Of course, she wasn't single. My name is Chance Myers. I'm a sophomore in the law school. Remember to find me if you're interested in joining the school student union. As they left, the students in the student union at the freshman reception couldn't help but exchange glances. Did she come to the wrong school? We're not a film and television university. I wonder which department she's in. She's so good looking, it's probably the media department. No matter which it is, it's definitely not the four major departments. I think one more person will be added to the popular girls list. This year's new students are very good. 
What do you mean by adding one more girl? She obviously stands out among all the others. Since there weren't many people there yet, Bessie didn't have to wait in a long line and managed to complete the formalities in less than an hour. She was assigned to room 301 in the old teaching building. It was still early and there was no one else in the room. Four beds were inside, each with a name affixed. Bessie's bed was near the window. She and Michael packed up everything and went downstairs instead of staying in the bedroom. There were a total of three days for the new students to sign up. After signing up, they didn't necessarily have to live in the dormitory. Some students took advantage of the three days to have fun with their parents. At the same time, a black car stopped at the entrance of a bustling commercial street. The middle-aged man sat in the driver's seat. He parked the car and looked at James in amazement. Your daughter got admitted to a university in Evanston? This area was the university town of Evanston and was where all the well-known universities were gathered. It wasn't an easy feat to be admitted here. The smile on James's face was indiscreet. Yeah, she's been admitted to the dual enrollment program this year. The middle-aged man was really surprised. He had only realized why James's information was so difficult to find once he found him. He lived in Fairfield, which appeared to be a Section 8 site, but was actually an experimental area for several big families. It was said to be in poverty alleviation, but that was only a cover to have fewer people go there for development. For this reason, Fairfield's information was especially controlled by the authorities and was extremely difficult to obtain. The middle-aged man still hadn't figured out what happened to James during these years. After communicating with him, he naturally knew that he had been working on the construction site, and his education level wasn't high. But he was the Miller family's son after all, and shouldn't stay in Fairfield forever. Fortunately, Tucker was still young and had a lot of learning capacity. As for the other two daughters, he had also heard of them, but didn't expect much. The Miller family's situation was so treacherous even retrieving James and Tucker had posed a great risk. However, these two were different from their expectations, so they didn't anticipate much from the two daughters and didn't know that one had been admitted to a university in Evanston. Surprised, the middle-aged man didn't ask much and only instructed James not to babble. Then, he felt too harsh and casually asked what Bessie was studying. James didn't know what she was studying, so he said excitedly, She plays the violin very well. Bessie had sent Tucker a video of her playing before. Having said this, James took out his mobile phone to show the middle-aged man. Look at this. The middle-aged man wasn't really interested and felt a little impatient at the moment. He had only asked perfunctorily. When Bessie came out of the dormitory, James and Tucker were still outside Northwestern University. They had only waited two minutes at the intersection. Anne had originally planned to go to Austria, but now that the placing had been given to Henson and school had started, she had come with Grace to sign up. They were driving to Northwestern University in the Perez family's car. At the intersection, Anne looked out the window out of habit and immediately saw James standing there. She clenched her hands and said in disbelief, Mom, why are they here? Anne knew James's current situation. In the past, every trip to Chicago had been to ship goods for the factory, and every penny had to be calculated carefully. The living expenses and accommodation fees after arriving in Evanston. Even if James had the money to come to Evanston, where did he get the money to spend on his accommodation here? Episode 259 Bessie's place was given to Henson. Following her gaze, Grace saw James and Tucker standing at the intersection. James indeed stood out as he didn't have the slightest sense of refinement. He looked coarse and indifferent, and when put with elites, he instantly looked like a driver or a bodyguard. Hearing them, the driver slowed down and glanced in the rearview mirror. Madame, Miss Smith, do you see your friend? Do I need to stop? No. Grace returned to her senses and immediately refused, her face dark. Drive quicker. 
She had escaped from that small town with great difficulty. Besides, if Elise and the Perez family knew about James, even if they didn't make it obvious on the surface, they would definitely mock them behind their backs. Anne also retracted her gaze and stayed silent. Since she was studying at Northwestern University, James would definitely want to tag along if they stopped the car. With his image, it was the first day of school and Anne didn't want people to know that her biological father was like this. The Perez family's car drove away quickly and rounded a corner. Anne glanced back and no longer saw them at the intersection. She heaved a sigh of relief. By that point, James and Bessie were already in the coffee shop. Tucker showed Bessie the game page on his phone. Taking the phone, Bessie glanced at it and was taken aback. He had passed the round. Mr. Cheatham had let her play this grid game on the mobile phone when she was very young. However, ordinary grid games required strong, logical thinking in net organization. It was precisely because of this that Mr. Cheatham discovered her talent with computers. Later, with her smartphone, Bessie had developed this mini-game and made it a little more difficult. She had only casually sent a bunch of games to Tucker, including this. Bessie hadn't expected that Tucker would play this game and clear almost all the levels. She had only sent him the screen recording as an inspiration. Who knew that he would pass the level today after seeing the screen recording last night? While talking to James, Michael noticed Bessie's silence and glanced at her. He put down the coffee and whispered, What is it? Taking the coffee and supporting her chin with one bony hand, she said lazily, Nothing. She stared at Tucker, slightly surprised. She always thought that her IQ and talent in the computer had come from her grandfather, but now it seemed like, though other aspects might have been from her grandfather, as for the computer, it was another matter. She had been taught by Mr. Cheatham when she was young, but Tucker hadn't. Now she had discovered that Tucker had been blessed from above with talent. Where are you staying? Leaning back in the chair, she tapped the cup casually with her fingertips. Her fingers reflected against the edge of the cup as she tapped slowly and rhythmically. James had been focused on her, but had stayed silent since he knew that she probably didn't want to hear from him much. But at this question, he immediately replied, Park Place Apartments, Unit 1 or Unit 2? James was stuck at this point. The middle-aged man had told him the address at Park Place Apartments, but James didn't remember it very clearly. Glancing at him indifferently, Tucker said, Park Place Apartments, Building 26, Unit 1, 801. James laughed sheepishly. He picked up his cup and took a sip of coffee, with his eyes lowered. Uh, I think so. Tucker, your memory is so good. By the way, he thought of something and glanced at Bessie. What if Uncle Jack sends people to find you? He can't find my information, Bessie said casually. After finishing lunch, Michael first took James and Tucker back. After receiving Patrick's call, he dropped Bessie off at the Highline Apartments before leaving again. Marvin had gone to hand over a new pot of flowers to Mary today. Bessie practiced the violin for a while upstairs, then came out with her phone after thinking about a few things. Putting on her cap, she got in the elevator, pressed the button, and sent a message to Mr. Cheatham. Half an hour later, at the Evanston Financial Center, a car parked at the World Poker Tour's headquarters. This area was full of high-rise buildings, and almost all of Evanston Corporation's headquarters were here. Bessie got out and found that the door of the World Poker Tour's building wasn't guarded. Since the bid was still ongoing, many people came and went in an endless stream. In the center of the hall was a transparent blue three-dimensional projection, which was the focus of several people's attention. Bessie glanced around and walked directly to the elevator. The security guard immediately hurried forward when he saw this. My apologies, miss, this elevator. It was dedicated to internal staff. Before he could finish his sentence, Bessie took out a thin, black mobile phone and pressed it against the elevator sensor. The elevator door opened. She walked inside and lifted her head slightly to look at the guard. Because the brim of her cap was pressed down, only her delicate jaw could be seen. 
and her voice was soft and cold. Is there something wrong with the elevator? The guard finally reacted. Nothing. Go ahead. He was still standing at the elevator entrance when the elevator door closed. He watched the elevator climb up from floor one to another until it reached the 21st floor. The guard was even more shocked at that. The 20th and 21st floors were the IT departments, especially the 21st floor, which was the elite core layer of the IT department. The chairman had specially separated the first floor. After that, every floor of the entire company was very lively, and there were almost 100 people on each floor. On the other hand, only 20 people worked on the 21st floor, so it was very quiet, and even cleaners only entered at a specific time. It was the World Poker Tour's most mysterious department. The guard was also a newcomer to the World Poker Tour and had never seen a core figure who worked on the 21st floor. Someone else paused at the door to stare at the elevator. It was Thomas. Are you okay? Jacob glanced at Thomas. When the elevator door closed, Thomas withdrew his gaze and massaged his temple. It's nothing. I might have seen wrongly out of lethargy. How could Bessie be here? It was 5.30 in the afternoon. When the World Poker Tour's office hours ended, Bessie came out of the 21st floor. Checking her phone, she saw a message from Michael asking where she was. So she replied to him with the intersection. Right after replying, a black car stopped beside her. The window was lowered down, revealing Rosemary's face in the rear seat. Bessie, why are you here? Get in, it's so hot outside. Getting into the back seat, Bessie pulled off her peaked cap and said expressionlessly, I'm here to shop. From the driver's seat, Secretary Peterson glanced in the rearview mirror. He felt extremely doubtful about this. The commercial street was separated from the financial center by a street, right? However, Bessie was Rosemary's darling. She asked in concern, What did you buy? Did you buy a lot? Are they being delivered? I just bought a computer, Bessie replied after thinking for a while. Oh, Rosemary nodded. You like playing games, right? I'll help you get a computer from the World Poker Tour a few days from now. Their computers are very good. Bessie paused and then just said, Thank you. It was 7 o'clock in the evening. Uncle Jack had just arrived to see James's condition at the Park Place apartments when someone knocked on the door. The middle-aged man went to open the door. Outside the door was a man wearing a red peaked cap. He handed a box to the middle-aged man and said concisely, Hello, this is a computer for Tucker. After saying this, without waiting for the middle-aged man's reply, he directly returned to the elevator and left. The middle-aged man gave the computer to Tucker, feeling a little puzzled. Tucker, did you buy a computer? Tucker looked down and opened the box. There was a black computer inside. It was identical to Bessie's. His eyes lit up slightly and his voice became higher pitched. He raised his head and replied, no, my sister gave it to me. She had given it to him, not bought it for him. But few people would understand that. He turned on the computer and it booted very quickly. The screen was of a photo of a barren desert with many game icons on top of it. He took the computer to the bedroom directly. How did his sister contact him? Uncle Jack looked at the middle-aged man. Go and take a look at the computer. The middle-aged man went to look at the computer and returned three minutes later. He replied respectfully, Tucker's playing games. His sister... His sister gave him dozens of games. Dozens of games? Uncle Jack frowned and went to take a look. Tucker was indeed playing games. He was in a good mood today and wasn't annoyed when he saw Uncle Jack and the others come to look. Instead, he asked politely, Do you want to play? No. Uncle Jack stood behind him and frowned even deeper at the mess of game icons on the computer. Anne had moved into Northwestern University's female dormitory. After coming out of the shower, Anne noticed her computer screen displaying her Twitter page with 12 million fans. She had opened it previously. Two of her roommates were discussing it enviously. Seeing her, they couldn't help but gasp. 
Anne, is this your Twitter? It's amazing. You have the same amount of followers as the second tier celebrity. Anne smiled casually and didn't take it to heart. She dried her hair, put the towel aside, and accidentally touched the mouse. It opened a private message. It showed the little woodfish's message. Are you two going to the student recruitment drive in two days? The short-haired roommate sitting next to Anne asked. She was extremely enthusiastic about the school's student union. The other roommate shook her head. I want to go, but I'm not familiar with the four major departments, nor am I that pretty. They might not want me, but Anne can definitely go. Anne, you might be our dormitory savior in the future. The university's student union was pretty much an organization independent of the school, with the considerable authority of its own. Yeah, Anne, you're so good looking, you'll definitely get in. The short-haired roommate put her chin on her hand and stared at Anne. The selection of students for the student union was solely based on a few requirements. Those who were good-looking, sociable, or were proficient in a particular skill would be selected. Anne paused and calmly asked, Four major departments? Episode 260 School Begins Though she had already been in Evanston for a long time, she always thought she would leave for Austria and hadn't paid much attention to Northwestern University's affairs. Hence, she felt rather unfamiliar with what her roommate was saying. It's the way our school is organized. Our school has more than 20 departments, big and small, but there are only four really powerful departments, namely the Politics and Law Department, the Science and Technology Department, the Medicine Department, and the Mathematics Department. These four departments are extremely impressive. I wanted to enter the Politics and Law Department, but unfortunately, I didn't score high enough, so I could only come to the Economics Department. The short-haired girl leaned back on her chair and shook her head, but she obviously didn't know enough about the four departments. Anne looked away thoughtfully. When she saw the opened private message, she reached out to close it, but her hands suddenly paused when she read the message. Little Woodfish's message was very simple. She'd sent two pictures comparing music scores and the video from the Evanston Association's official website to Anne. Anne, this person's score is very similar to yours. Narrowing her eyes, Anne picked up her earphones and clicked on the video. At a glance, she could tell it was Bessie's video from the final exhibition. She hadn't listened seriously to her performance before. After all, listening to Bessie's performance only reminded her of how jealous she was. After listening to everything, Anne's heart pounded precipitously, almost jumping out of her chest. Her hands holding the earphones trembled slightly. She suddenly remembered the plagiarism that Mr. Grint had talked about a year ago. She had picked up that sheet music at the Smith family's house when it had fallen out of Bertha's luggage. It was too coincidental now that it was so similar to Bessie's music. Anne began to connect the dots. An inconceivable idea jumped out in her heart. That sheet of music might have belonged to Bessie. She closed Little Woodfish's private message and sat in a daze. She didn't have the heart to pay attention to the conversation about the student union and the four big departments. No, Anne leaned back and remembered something. She still had the manuscript of the sheet music. At the same time, Slagdragon was making himself at home in Jared's house. Taking out a bottle of cold beer from the refrigerator, Slagdragon chatted incessantly to Jared and dialed a video called Giant Crocodile. It rang for a while before Giant Crocodile picked up and asked simply, What? He was probably outside as his background was dark and his face couldn't be seen clearly. Nothing much? I just wanted to know why you're not in the least bit curious about Lone Wolf, said Slagdragon mysteriously as he took a sip of beer. Of course, I'm curious about my big brother. Giant Crocodile put a cigarette in his mouth. He sounded calm, but his eyebrows were knitted in a frown. I was busy these two days. You bumped into some trouble? Slag Dragon finished the beer, squeezed the can, and threw it directly into the trash can. 
Tell me, what's the trouble? Giant Crocodile was very moved at first and was about to reply when Slag Dragon said, Hearing about it will make me happy. Ignore him. Jared reached out for Slag Dragon's phone. The border's not peaceful recently? Something like that. Giant Crocodile got into a car. When the lights turned on in the back seat, it illuminated his eyebrows, reflecting his 30-something years old face with its exotic handsomeness. He paused for a while and frowned. A force is indeed a little troublesome. I wanted to contact you, to check it out for me. Which force? Jared laughed. Not many people could be feared by Giant Crocodile. He's from Austria, at the same level as the Underground Alliance. His name is Terry something, and there's also someone from the Hacker Alliance. Giant Crocodile pinched the cigarette and threw it out the window. You shouldn't litter. Jared glanced at him and frowned. Austria, the same level as the Underground Alliance. This thing isn't easy to investigate. If it was easy, would I come to you? Giant Crocodile gestured for his subordinate to drive. Jared returned the phone to Slag Dragon and poured a glass of tea. Only Lone Wolf can investigate in Austria. You want to place an order too? Are you in the queue? Besides just investigating that power, more importantly, Lone Wolf was also a hacker, and Giant Crocodile now needed a hacker to help him bear his fangs. My big brother will make me wait in line? Giant Crocodile lifted his chin, extremely confident. Having held back for a long time, Slag Dragon finally couldn't endure it anymore. You call him Big Brother all day long, but who is your Big Brother? Giant Crocodile looked colder online than in real life. Through the video, he glanced slightly at Slag Dragon. You're so talkative. Did Lone Wolf particularly despise you? Slag Dragon was speechless. At the thought of what happened two days ago, he suddenly felt stabbed in the heart. At the same time, Patrick handed a folder to Michael in the study room at the Highline Apartments. There was news from Terry. He said, He went to the border? Michael flipped through the folder casually and then put it back on the table. Patrick nodded, then shook his head. It's not a big problem. He's still discussing with Alexander. Michael looked up and thought for a while. They were still talking when Marvin called them to go down for dinner. Patrick stopped talking and followed behind Michael. Marvin used to think that Patrick dealt with the Clark family affairs, but he had already abandoned this naive idea when he returned to Evanston this time. He had faintly heard Patrick mention Terry, so he asked curiously, What's Terry doing now? He already knew that of all the five brothers, Christopher and Alexander were in Austria's manor. His other brother seemed to be in business. Marvin only ever saw Terry in the group chat, and given how both Christopher and Alexander's lips were sealed about him, Marvin still didn't know his profession. Him? Patrick glanced at him and put his phone back in his pocket. He's stationed in Austria all year round. You might as well ask him next time you meet. Downstairs, Rosemary was still talking to Bessie, asking her about the registration today. The science and technology department is good. She picked up her fork and smiled. You should try your best to enter the Northwestern University Student Union. It'll be useful for you when you go to the Research Institute if... The thought that Bessie wouldn't be able to enter the Research Institute didn't occur to her at all. After all, Bessie was sought after by the deans of two departments. Rosemary thought of something and sighed, taking back her words. Forget it, you haven't even entered yet. It's too far in the future. Glancing at her, Bessie felt like her words had a different meaning, but she didn't ask further. Speaking of this, Rosemary smiled at Michael while picking up a bite of vegetables. Michael glanced indifferently at her and asked just as indifferently, Patrick, have we been short of funds recently? Patrick swallowed the words, not lacking, and said with a straight face, very lacking. Rosemary's smile immediately disappeared. Don't, I was joking with you. Although Michael had already withdrawn from the company, whenever the company's funds couldn't be transferred, or when there were too many bank loan procedures and most of the funds had to be utilized, Rosemary would borrow from him. 
Michael looked very politely at her and said apologetically, I'm not joking. I'm really lacking money. After finishing her meal, Bessie put down her fork and picked up her phone. I'm going upstairs to take a shower. At that moment, her phone happened to display a message from Jared. There's a new order from Giant Crocodile. Bessie massaged her temples. It was surely not a simple matter if Giant Crocodile had to beg her for help. She just hoped she could finish it before school began. Bessie was busy with Giant Crocodile's affairs and naturally didn't know that rumors about her were spreading wildly on Twitter. Most people were following the Evanston Association's Twitter. Both Bessie and Anne were relatively well-known students. Little Woodfish's comparison photo had been spread among Anne's fans. Several parts were almost identical. One was posted this year, while the other was from last year. One of Anne's fans couldn't suppress their anger and posted on Twitter. At Evanston Association, what a joke, a future star in the violin industry? She plagiarized so obviously, can't you tell? It has only been a year since Anne's video and she still dared to publish it? Does she think that us fans don't have ears? The Twitter post was taunting, and the pictures from Little Woodfish's comparison as well as very professional analysis were also included. Not only had Anne's fans bought a spot on the hot search for this post, but Anne herself was also a trendy influencer. Hence, in less than an hour, there were 10,000 comments. The Evanston Association officials naturally noticed this huge commotion. I saw it. It does seem like plagiarism. The few people in charge of the Evanston Association exchanged glances, unsure who had plagiarized who. What should we do now? A light bulb flashed in someone else's mind, and he suddenly remembered this matter. I remember that Mr. Grint said something about Anne plagiarizing last year, and so he didn't accept her as an apprentice. This matter concerned Mr. Grint and his apprentice. The people in charge of the official Twitter account were just ordinary members and didn't dare call the shots on this influential matter. Hence, they went to contact Mr. Grint. Several people in the Evanston Association were jealous of Bessie, especially since she was Mr. Grint's head student. Countless people wanted to blow this matter up. Several people longed to hit her while she was down. The news soon reached Mr. Anderson's ears. Mr. Anderson's status in the Violin Association had plummeted after the last exhibition competition, and he had been depressed for the past two days until the news broke the night before. Mr. Anderson, this incident is indeed too coincidental. Someone pondered beside him and said in a low voice, it's a fact that Anne performed this a year before Bessie. Mr. Anderson laughed, his eyes cold. If Bessie could compose such a song a year ago, why would she wait till this year to enter the Evanston Association? Episode 261 Computer Skills Run in the Family 